Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, we're talking to senior structural steel specialist Alex Morales about structural steel design and how he went from architecture to falling in love with steel. He also talks about some of the latest innovative steel systems designed by AISC and how they are helping structural engineers. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Now let's jump into our conversation of the week with Alex. This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE structural exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE structural exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S.com. Alex, first, welcome to the show. We're so happy to have you. Now, in your own words, can you please provide our audience a little bit of background on your career journey up to today and how you transitioned from architecture to structural steel design? Yes. Well, first off, first off, I'd really want to say thank you both so much for having me here. I think there's a lot of good content that comes out of this channel. And so anytime we're able to sort of come on board and contribute and have dialogue, I think it, it makes for a better industry. So Thanks so much for doing that. And I'll get right into kind of that career evolution. Um, I always like to say that, you know, we, we like to think that we're sort of the uh, captains of our own ship, if you will, where we think we, we're in control of our career, where we, what we're going to do, where we're going to go, you know, what helm are we going to land at? And so for me, it was kind of trying to figure out early on what it was that I wanted to do after uh, you know, going through elementary school and then high school and then getting pressed by my grandmother, who is probably the most influential person in my life, um, who's really the, the one responsible for raising me, but who was also kind of darn strict, <laughs> if, I, if I can just say that, because she wanted to make sure that I had a plan, right? It wasn't just plan A, but also like, what's your plan B in case plan A doesn't work? So, you know, long story short, the time of graduation where we get really excited in high school and it's like what are you going to do you know what, what what are your plans and so my my answer to grandmother was um you know, I kind of want to be an artist you know like, like drawing and that's what I want to do for the rest of my life I grew up in Brazil right because if you can imagine kind of this very laid back style like the beach bum kind of thing that comes into mind and growing up in that sort of environment where you're kind of sort of asking yourself, you know, what do I want to get out of life? And then you see people kind of hanging out on the beach and drawing and painting the sunset. I'm like, I want that. That's exactly <laughs> what I want to get out of my life. But, you know, of course, reality sunk in and, and Graham, Graham, Graham's was like, you know, there's no way that's going to work out because she laid down the gauntlet and she's like, do you know how much I had to work to get to where I needed to get? And do you know where food comes from? And of course, that old adage, you know, money doesn't come from trees. In our case, it was, you know, money doesn't come from banana trees because it's, it's Brazil. And so, and so that's, that's kind of reality, right? And so it's one thing where you really love your grandmother, but the other thing is you're kind of also very scared of her, right? So it's kind of that, 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 that fear of not wanting to disappoint your grandmother that was like, okay, you know, I got to get my act together. You know, what do I do? So I kind of researched a whole gamut of, 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 careers and 
and what I wanted to do, I kind of wanted to be for a long time, I wanted to be, uh, you know, lifeguard. And that's, that was the other thing. Like, no, that's also not a career that you can land on. You got to find something else, right? You can't be a lifeguard for the rest of your life. I'm like, oh, well, that sounds so many people die in the ocean, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I know exactly. I'm like, you know, so many people, it'll it'll be kind of a very safe career. It's also not, not a career that would pan out. So Finally, long story short, it was architecture for me. And it was um, kind of a, along the lines of something between art and science, right? So, you know, there's that artistic element and approach to, to being an architect. But there's also that medium of science of understanding humans and understanding environments and understanding, you know, climate and understanding materials and construction. So it's kind of very scientific at the same time, but it's artistic. And so that's the direction that I went and I kind of ran with it, right? So I graduated, I ended up coming to the States and I graduated from AM. And, you know, it was uh, probably, I'm not sure if you guys had any uh, colleagues in college that happened to be in architecture, but you sort of live inside of your architecture studio, right? <laughs> I did and that for a couple of quarters, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And so I'm looking out of my window at, in studio and I see people playing Frisbee and I'm like, I wonder what major they're in because I'm always, <laughs> right? I'm like, I, w- I want to do that too, but it didn't quite happen. Um, but it was a, a rigorous program. And, and at the end of the day, you know, I, I really did fall in love with that, with that career choice. Um, I began in residential architecture, uh, right out, right outside of San Antonio, right, which is exploding. Uh, if you guys aren't aware, but it's also one of the major cities that there is lots and lots of development. I can almost see Austin and San Antonio at some point, just kind of merging into this huge metropolis. There's always like a 45 minute drive or a 40 minute drive, depending on how fast you drive. But you know, they're not very far, farly placed apart. But that was my introduction to like the real world of like working in architecture and fighting with the plotter like at three in the morning and setting off the, you know, the alarms. And my boss is calling like, what are you doing up there? I'm like, I'm like the best intern ever, right? Because I'm, <laughs> I'm here at three, three in the morning and I'm sorry that I woke you up, but, you know, I guess I'm working hard, right? So um, residential, about two years. And then I started getting kind of an itch like, you know, what do I do next? And I would see my peers and we'd be working on things like facades and the floor plan was kind of all the same. I'm like, uh, you know, can we do something different? And, you know, kind of for me at the time, it was, you know, sort of coming into terms of leaving the safety net of my first job, because that's kind of all you know, right? And so you love the people you work with and you love what you're doing, but you also, uh, like both of you who are stellar, have this itch on career where you want to develop and you kind of are curious. And I think that's the great thing of, 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 of both engineering and architecture and even construction where curiosity is what leads us to next bigger and better things in the built environment. And so residential was fantastic, but I really was curious about the world of commercial design and construction. And as they say, I had to leave that nest. And then I ended up working for a commercial design for an architecture. And I'll fast forward some time. I don't think this is true. You could, you, both of you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I kind of feel that there's like a three to five year window in career employment where you're like, hmm, <laughs> like what's next kind of thing. Like, you know, uh, you know, what else can I do to better myself uh, professionally? Do I go after a credential? You know, do I try to see if there's something else that I'm interested in? But Seems that's about right. human yeah. nature. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Most, exactly. For sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I just think that, you know, that is what, if we didn't ask those questions, if we didn't have that itch, I think it would be a very stagnant industry. You know, and the fact that we're not is because people do have those questions and have that itch. And so um, I, again, found myself uh, working in really spectacular projects. I worked on anything from, you know, uh, you know K-12 projects to healthcare projects to, uh, you know, utility overhaul projects, kind of really grinding, just kind of, uh, you know, dealing with machinery and, and dealing with logistics kind of thing. Uh, but then it was, 
it was being in the field and doing my punch list and walking and interacting with like the on-site trade of you know people that were floating concrete or jib board or installing rebar and i'm like wow this is this is so amazing right because you kind of are on one end really quite um enamored by the idea of what you're drawing you know whether you're using revit or cat or you're like this is really cool like this is going to become a building but then your eyes really and once you go out into the field and you're like oh wait that's the detail that I was drawing. That's what it looks like in physicality. So, um, you know, that, that was uh, my coming to, coming to the moment where I, you know, wanted to join the dark side. You know, that was probably, you know, six years into that career and, and wanting to see how do I better myself as a designer, right? So I didn't propose to myself, you know, how do I leave my company? I proposed to myself, how do I add value to what I'm doing and kind of become a better designer? I'm not abandoning architecture. I just want to improve my understanding of it. And so that means understanding construction materials and methods and logistics and project management. And so I did, I, I joined a, a general contractor and boy, I mean, if you guys ever tell me, would you imagine that you did what you were going to do? Like, I kid you not. I remember specifically really hot day in August. And Kara, you might appreciate this because they're down here in Texas and especially in Houston. You know, it's almost like in the summertime when you breathe, you're basically inside of a spa and a sauna. There's just so much yeah. humidity, right? And so, yes, yeah, for all of our that. listeners who don't know, me and Alex both worked in Houston around the same time. And we were just talking uh, a little bit about how we were ships in the night. We always met each other at trade shows. So, yes, I am very very, very intimately aware of how hot it is in Houston and how humid. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect metaphor. Ships in the night, right, right <laughs> off the ocean with the humidity. So how, how amazing is that, right? So, so yes, that was kind of, you know, the, the, the idea that in August, one day I'd be doing administrative project management, you know, pushing paper, making sure that uh, the project was bought out, making sure that we were doing our safety checks, making sure that we were communicating with folks that were building the things on the ground. That's uber important in project management. And then the other day, I would, I would be on a roof doing, helping you know, do, unload some material. You never knew what you wanted to do. So hands down, I give you know, general contractors a big shout out because they deal with so much. You might, you might think differently because some, there are some times when you go into the trailer and they look like they have the best job ever. They're just kind of sitting there. But those are kind of the, the low that goes in cycles in a project, right? So you mobilize a project. There's a slow start. And, and you see that you're like, wow, you have the best job ever. But there are times when they were, they're work, literally working 24-7. And I, I got to do that in August in, you know, in, in the heat. And I'm like, wait, did I really sign up for this? And at the time, it was the most awful experience ever because I was probably sweating 10 quarts of water that I had just <laughs> drank like three minutes, ago, man. three minutes prior, right? And then the phone was ringing and, and I had clients getting mad at me. Like, why aren't you answering my emails? I'm like, do you realize that I'm on top of the roof trying to unload material right now? Like, that is, those are the types of hats that you had to wear, right? And so the notion is you do what needs to be done to get the job done, right? And you're, you're, all of these notions of, you know, well, I'm the project manager, so I wear this hat, you know, those, those are kind of blurred lines. They really don't exist uh, because you're, you really operate as a team. And so on the general contracting world, that, you know, that dose of humility came like tenfold for me. And it was, and it was a, a wonderful crescendo for me. And um, Finally, as I take you through this very lengthy process of career evolution, so I know you were excited. So you're like, well, then what happened after that? Well, after that, you know, it was coming, coming to where I'm at now. You know, I'm now at AISC, the American Institute of Steel Construction. And I like to say I probably with some of the most talented, you know, smartest people I've ever worked with. Um, but that passion began in the field because I saw how steel flew together, like, that was for me like the aha moment of like, wow, like if I wanted to develop a, you hear this term, SME, subject matter expertise. And then you're thinking in your head like, well, what else do I do? How do I build? Like, how do I contribute? Because I have these panic attacks. Matt, 
in Kara. I don't know if you guys do or not, but sometimes I'm like, I was going to sound a little morbid. Like, I'm going to die, like, at some point. And, like, what did I do? And this is really strange to think about. But, uh, but I know, I don't, I don't want to call it a midlife crisis. Maybe it is at this stage. But, you know, it's like you want to do as much as you can with the time that you have now. And that, these are kind of the moments that, you know, that you, 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 you think you, you kind of grapple with. And so uh, I, I got attacked by the flying steel and that for me, that was like the most beautiful thing. And I wanted to know more about it. And so I came to the most perfect place for that, right? Because all we do at AISC is, you know, study and, and interject the process in, as it's related to structural steel design and construction. So hopefully that you appreciate that and you're not exhausted with that long sort of uh <laughs> walk through memory lane we did about you know that was like a 10k sprint there so I hope you <laughs> no no that was a really great kind of summation about your career background I know you and I have talked before and I I don't know that I've ever asked you about it before so it's good to know that you started all the way from residential I can I can uh empathize with that <laughs> you know, Kara it only took you about 10 years to ask so I knew you would <laughs> <laughs> that was the time. <laughs> yeah, Alex, thanks for that. Uh, two things that I wanted to touch on. Uh, yes, especially working and talking to some of the project engineers on the general contractor side. Yeah, there are those times where uh, you don't appreciate, or maybe the engineers don't appreciate what they go through. Uh, but talking to some of the engineers there and, and some of the experiences they do, I could compare it to like if you're in the office and you're a structural design engineer, you, you know when there's a fire. Uh, but if you're the general contractor, you are in the fire. <laughs> like you're the ones that are like burning <laughs> up. That's how much pressure sometimes that they're they're going through. And um, Sometimes that's literal, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's that true. Yes. Once. True. <laughs> On a job site. Yeah. It's yeah, like, it's like here's, <laughs> imagine, imagine this comment like, oh, did, like you had no clue how many fires I had to pull out today. Like that, in, in this literal, in this literal yeah. sense, that happened to me one time. <laughs> that could have been literal. So we can add firefighter <laughs> yeah. to your list of yeah. <laughs> professional firefighter. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's my, the, my hustle. <laughs> yeah, then the second thing I wanted to touch upon was, uh, yeah, for sure, in terms of like the career, uh, thinking about your career and what you can do next and how you can add value, I think that's definitely something that I think ev everyone goes through. Maybe not everyone, but uh, a lot of people that maybe that have a growth mindset and they want to see what they can be doing. I think that's definitely one of the things that uh, people think about because I think most people want to, want to add value. They want to grow. And, uh, you know, luckily for me, at least in my career so far, it's, that's one of the things that I, I've been really loving about my career is there's always something different. And I've got to work on a variety of projects. And I know that's one of the, the things that, you know, that keeps me in this industry is to get to work on different types of projects, because even though you may have done one, you, you can still get better at it, or it's a different type of project. And I think that's one of the things that uh, for most people, I think, and will want in their career having that growth and how they can be of better value to uh in their careers and uh next the next question i wanted to ask alex since we're getting into the steel for our listeners that aren't too experienced in steel design could you go over what steel design actually entails sure <clears throat> so i know that your your listeners are sort of all through the prism of experience levels but when you think about steel design, um, you think first in the literal sense, almost like what comes to mind, at least in my head was, you know, you're designing steel, like what does that look like, right? So do you design the sizes of the steel, like how, you know, how fat or chunky they are? And so to some extent, then the answer to that is yes, but then I'm going to kind of put all this in a really nice bubble wrap for you all or foil, whatever you prefer, or a burrito. Right. So here's oh burrito looks sounds really good right now. It's like yeah, it's almost that's better. sweet. But the uh, <laughs> the the uh, uh, the the idea of steel design and construction, like in any sort of material, but specifically in terms of steel, um, you've got a basically um, you know x amount of mills in the United States. You've got major mills that produce and roll out steel shapes, 
And so um, you don't necessarily have to des design a shape. So those are already kind of industry standards and they're set. And what, as a designer or as a structural engineer, at least in terms of um, you know, what some of your listeners may do, um, it's, it's selecting that material and sizing it um, in accordance with the structural loading criteria and the building typology, right? So you may you may go through using you know a certain uh, wide flange and beam selection um, for parking garages that would be different for like let's say a K twelve school, and that has to do with what lives in that building, right? What live loads you you have, right? Some loads are kind of dead loads and and what that building receives less of live loads. And so those are all kind of the, the considerations that you make as a designer. So it's not so much that you're always doing the structural calculations and analysis, which is a big part of it, but you're also designing by virtue of decision-making of what you select based on what you understand uh, that the building's ultimate function will be or bridges or what have you, right? So that's one aspect of the of structural steel design. The other as, aspect of it is uh, something I'm really uh, sort of tout and passionate about, which is collaboration. Because structural engineers work with architects and building owners and a whole gamut of people that have you know, sort of stakeholders that have a vested interest in the project. And so what you do as part of the team is have, uh, you know, powwows of oh, this is envision as an architect that you want to accomplish and me as the structural engineer uh, based on what you're telling me that you want to accomplish i recommend that we select this system right uh, maybe maybe it's not all the time aesthetically driven maybe one of the big factors that we have to consider is budget like that's for for whatever reason and rightfully so that's always one of the major factors of what we end up using in a building and so as a Structural engineer, you could say, well, if budget is of a concern, then how do you quantify budget? Well, budget is more than just, you know, the cost of the material. It's also the logistics of procurement and fabrication and installation, right? I, and I'll give you all a quick rule of thumb that you could embed into your design process for all the listeners out there that are going to, you know, do great things for the world. For structural steel, there's a good rule of thumb for like a traditional steel package in terms of cost, right? So the cost for the material for just, you know, wide flange structural steel components is that there's about a, you know, a 60-40 split where 40% of the cost is associated with the material and 60% and of it is actually coming from fabrication. So here's where you have really good uh, value that you could bring to your team. You can say, well, if, the, if I'm not actually gonna be saving more on the material, then maybe I save more out of the, the fabrication because that's the bigger pot of money that you know, we've, we've got more to, to sort of uh, manifest there. And so if you're a designer, you're kind of you know, laying down the foundation for, for bringing value to the architect or the owner, then you take that into consideration and you take that one step further by really um, kind of involving what we, we love to preach at AISC is talking to your fabricators that can bring to the table ideas on how to reduce fabrication costs, right? Um, I'll give you a quick story. Not too long ago, we had a, you know, sort of a project that came in through uh, Houston and it was, it's a confidential project, so I can't, I can't speak of the name, but it's really neat. And the project, I, I can speak of the shape. It, it's kind of shaped like the Louvre in, uh, in Paris, you know, that big pyramid with, gl with glazing all over. Yep. Well, that's kind of the intent. I can't give away the name of it. And so architect comes and says, hey, you know, AISC, um, you know, we've got the GC on board and, you know, uh, we want to know um, how to make this happen. And we've never really done anything like this before. This is kind of unique. So what, what do you propose? So the fabricator was actually the most knowledgeable in this regard because they, they get to say, well, on any given day, our shop operates this way. We have this many sort of men that operate. And so if this is the schedule you wanna meet, then we would recommend you know, going with the system uh, because we have that capacity. And in having those discussions, you're exponentially reducing risks, right? Because you're defining those unknowns like at the get-go by talking to, an, 
uh, an entity that has all of the expertise because they all they do is work with structural steel day in and day out, right? So that's the other aspect of, of design or structural steel design. And so I, hopefully that's really refreshing and kind of takes the idea of calculations and me meeting uh, structural criteria, right? Which is sort of the given in, in, in engineering design. The other aspect of design is to think about the, the, um, the value that you're bringing to the team based on exhausting your resources. And so for that reason, I really advocate for collaboration uh, with, with folks such as your fabricators, with institutions such, such as AISC who do nothing but deal in the weeds of, of steel. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tip just because, um, yeah, I think oftentimes that's what the cost of steel is. I think what goes through on the mind of uh, most structural engineers, the, you know, the weight of steel, and that's probably what's gonna cost the most. But uh, like you were saying, the the sixty forty rule. That's I think that's a that's a great tip. Most of it's gonna come from uh, the fabrication and maybe even like the welds or how expensive is gonna the labor to install that. A lot of the times, uh, maybe going with a bigger size, but reducing that fabrication uh, could save uh, a lot, uh, especially out in the West Coast. At least uh, I know that's uh, when we're dealing with those. Uh, heavy welds that could save a lot of money just because the fabrication and and uh, how everything comes together, that's actually pretty expensive, like you were saying. A hundred percent. And who knew that there were all these types of welds, right? You would think, okay, <laughs> a weld is a weld. There's so many kinds and yeah, there are cost implications. So yes, talk to your fabricator. If you don't know who they are, you know, come to Folks like like me uh, that are all over the country that can uh, really connect you to those experts, and I'll add one thing to that, for risk mitigation, which is uber important. Um, you don't want to what you don't want to do is uh, kind of bring on board a fabricator that doesn't necessarily have the expertise or the portfolio of work in that building typology just to save dollars, right? Uh, I know that kind of gets in the Maybe, maybe the realm of a general contractor, but if you truly operate as a team, you actually could voice, you know, raise that concern to the GC and just say, hey, you know, who are your qualified fabricators that you're bringing to the table and, you know, do dil diligence effort uh, to make sure that we bring in the right person. You don't want, you don't want to bring the, 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 the incorrect team and then end up paying for it later. Yeah, that's for sure. I know, um, obviously, you and I worked in Houston at the same time, but a lot of our con a lot of the contractors or the GCs that I worked with would do almost like selective bids. They would just do invites to certain fabricators because they knew that those teams had the capabilities to do whatever construction it was, especially if it was very specialized. That but I also wanted to practice. thank you for that very simplified overview of uh, structural steel design because a lot of our listeners are a bit younger and you know they they may still be in school and they don't really understand like I've tried to explain I have younger cousins who are still in college are not in engineering at all and they're like so what is like engineering what does <laughs> steel design actually entail like how can you design steel? You know, so I appreciate you actually explaining that in a, such a simplified way. It, that will help a lot of our younger listeners who don't maybe haven't put two and two together from their structural steel design class, which as you can see, I still have my AISC <laughs> book cool. behind me. Yes. <laughs> that, that used. We need um, to give you all of the different colors just so that you can have Yeah, you nice need the ribbon. blue one. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the newest one? <laughs> the yeah, blue one? Like a baby or the teal, yeah. <laughs> I know, right? You have it up in your like little icon. And I was like, oh, I have my steel manual just right behind me. This is nice. <laughs> wait, what, there's an icon? Oh, wait, yeah. Sorry, this one back here. Yes. Yeah, in your background. <laughs> 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 For all of my listeners who uh, don't listen on uh, or are listening on Spotify or Apple or a podcast, there's actually Alex has his little AISC icon, or I guess you would call it like the stamp. Yeah, I call it the AISC meatball. Right? The meatball. <laughs> are, we, are we talking about burritos and meatballs? 
<laughs> Y'all are obviously hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it is lunchtime where I'm at. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Alex, I'm a little bit curious because there, there's been a, a story shared with us about how you had a project that you worked on in Houston where you were able to flip a parking garage design from concrete to steel. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What was going through your mind? What was the process and how you were, I'm guessing, able to save the engineer, the contractor and the architect's money? Yes. So I do want to qualify by saying that I was sort of just the the agent of that manifestation because I there's nothing that ever happens in a bubble. So all of the glory for that really goes to the fabricator. And this was, again, you know, uh, making sure that there's a, the right team for the job, et cetera. But um, yeah, so the way the, the way this happened um, is in the in the exercise of exhausting uh, your options for your owner. Um, you know, the, the conversation was, is this garage going to be a concrete garage or is it going to be a steel garage? And for all intents and purposes, the, the I think it was a d- design development where the drawings were already at that stage and they were reflected to be post tension concrete. Um, so in the parking garage, which, you know, it, it, it happens, but there were other logistics that were associated that, um, were even beyond the immediacy of what was being reflected on the construction documents at that point. And by that, I mean, the owner was thinking long-term, right? Right. Like what is, you know, uh, what does this parking garage want to be later kind of thing? Um, you know, and they're also thinking schedule was the other thing and, and also risk mitigation and gosh, I just want to get this done. And so that feeling of like, gosh, I just want to get this done, kind of pointed to steel at that point, um, traditional steel. And so really it was because there was a need to accelerate the schedule and to do as much of the project offsite to mitigate onsite risks. And so when you think of it in terms of, you know, if we want to do less work on the foundations, because obviously we're reducing some of that loading, because now we go from, you know, something that's a little heavier to, to something lighter, um, then that's less digging uh, in simple terms. Um, that's less machinery on site. That's less bodies on site. That's, you know, for the general contractor who was actually um, really uh, looking forward to this op- option. Those things were also a very uh, sort of resounding positive because it, it, it coalesced not only what the owner wanted to accomplish as far as immediacy, but also uh, they wanted to get off the job site as soon as they could. In the terms for a general contractor, that's kind of always one of the big picture ideas is the least amount of time I am able to be on a project, the faster I can turn it over, the more profitable I will be as a general contractor, right? Because you have to pay, you end up paying less for of the general conditions, even your trailer on site, you don't have to pay the rent, et cetera. There's a trickle down effect to why, you know, designing and steel makes sense. And so we obviously talked about the pros and cons, you know, um, uh, it, it, it was a parking garage. Of course, it, there was there was no um, sort of enclosure. It was kind of an open air parking garage. And the other idea is, is here's, here's where it gets really interesting, is um, you want to squeeze as many parking spots as you can. And that's the name of the game for parking garage design, right? Especially is, in Houston. <laughs> especially, exactly, where we're running out of space. So we got we to gotta, we gotta fight for, for feet here and inches there, literally, like that's what you're doing. And I would, I'm going to throw out a question for your listeners. I'm going to give them like a half a second to answer it, right? Just virtually. So what's one of the, the biggest benefits of, a parking garage using structural steel versus concrete in terms of numbers of parking spots. Ready, set, go. Okay, that's good. So literally, that was like, I think that was less than half a second, but you know, hopefully you were able to answer, right? I think I'm gonna slow down my coffee here as, as I finish this part of the story. But the, 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 the trueness of it is that if you're trying to squeeze more parking spots, that means you're, you need more real estate. Right. And so that means you need slimmer columns, right? The profile of your column, you can reduce them as much as you can, right? And, and have the span a little larger than you can. You literally, you know, six inches here, six inches there, six inches there. Over time, they translate into a full parking figure. And then that translates into revenue for whoever owns that parking garage. 
And that's, that was the thing, right? We wanted to get rid of as many columns as possible. Um, you know, we, we, we exhausted all of the concerns of it's going to be exterior. Does it, is it going to be, you know, maintainable? Is, is thing, are things going to fall apart after everybody was like, okay, no, this is the attack, uh, you know, the, the, the attack mode. And this is what's going to happen. We're defining the unknowns. We're increasing the parking count. We're delivering the project faster. We we're actually taking columns out that were there before. Um, and, and some of the unique parts of this parking garage is that uh, if you can think of a spider, because this is the way architects think, uh, for, so if, you, if you have any architects out in the, in the audience, I think they will appreciate this. When you think of a spider, especially like these giant tarantulas, and you imagine that the center of gravity is kind of in the middle, and then their, their legs kind of stand out, right? And then they drop down to the ground. And in the middle, you've got this mass. And so that's kind of what, what this parking garage involved as well, where the structure, the columns were actually living on the perimeter of that parking garage, right? So, I mean, those are really cool, clever moments that were brought on board by the fabricator for, for first, right? And then really getting into this collaborative spirit uh, where AISC, we have an entity called the Steel Solutions Center and they're structural, bright and talented engineers, just like both of you are. And they kind of, you know, uh, defined what it needed to look. They helped with the sizing and then they, they turned over its study and gave it to the, to the um, architect, the general contractor and even the structural engineer because they actually had a structural engineer on board but they just wanted to make sure that they were doing all they could to make the owner happy, which is what we ought to do. So they came to AISC and say, okay, fine. What is it that we haven't thought about that maybe you thought about that maybe, you know, based on, you know, the mechanisms you have in your shop as a fabricator, you know, how can we all come to the table, literally sketch out some concepts, right? Then talk to AISC and say, has this been done before? Is there maybe a case study? And then after all those unknowns were resolved, then we turned over that study and said, this is what it looks like out of structural steel. And that was it, you know, it was a resounding success and it went from, from concrete to steel. So, and that was, I'm gonna give, give the shout out to uh, MSD fabricators were the ones that really- oh, MSD? Instrumental in <laughs> yeah. Josh Hansen, right? Is that right? MSD? Absolutely, yes. Yep. Josh Hansen. Yeah. That's Josh. a good team. Josh's ears are ringing right now, by the way. <laughs> I know. I was about to say, I saw your Structures Mag article also. Was it Structures Mag or Steel? Oh, what was it the Steel Magazine? Steel Construction Magazine or something like Modern that, where you Steel did the article with them? Yeah. 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 That was, uh, yeah, he's, he's fantastic. I mean, that's exactly, I know we're going to talk about mentorship, but I mean, boy, do we have an idea of the intersection of engineering? construction and architecture and fabrication. I mean, when all of those worlds collide, it makes for amazing outcomes. No, and I'm so glad that you brought that up because like, I know sometimes as engineers or architects, we almost talk in silos like, oh, well, you know, the GC doesn't know what I'm going through or like the, the contractor doesn't know what I'm doing. And there's sometimes maybe a gap in communication and we're like, oh, well, he just doesn't understand you know, and you, you discussed a lot about collaboration. And I think when you have, like, it almost makes you, and me and Matt have talked about this. There's different languages that you have to speak with different people and fabricated when you get a fabricator and an engineer and an architect and a GC all in the room together, it forces you to communicate in a way that's very simple, very easy. And it creates like a very, very clear, pathway to success in and it sounds like for your for your parking garage so i'm glad that you brought that up no, and i'm glad you. that it was msd i like them <laughs> thanks alex Absolutely. yeah that seems like really a, a creative solution for for what all the to help to help the owner out and that, that seemed really creative uh, could you go over to some of maybe some of the latest in a innovative uh, structural steel systems designed by AISC and how it's helping structural engineers. It seems like AISC had a big part in that and kind of alleviated some fears. Uh, what other designs uh, do they do? 
This video is also brought to you by Menard USA. Menard USA is a specialty ground improvement contractor that works nationally providing design build ground improvement solutions at sites with problematic soils. Menard works closely with civil, structural, and geotechnical engineers to minimize foundation costs for wide ranges of soil conditions, structure types, and loading conditions. To learn more about Menard USA or for help on your next project, please visit www.menardusa.com. Sure. So I know in the interest of time, because I don't want to keep you guys here, you know, after daylight savings time, we think we're still kind of in a, we have another hour, but I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk about the, probably my most exciting one. Uh, and, I, and I mean most, because I feel like I own it. I know I don't, I'm just, just, just totally flabbergasted by this concept. This is, this is the, the hard work of literally years of research, right? And that's what we do as an institution as AISC. We have over 100 years of dedicating laser focus to structural steel research and innovation and then give that back to everyone who has a stake, uh, a stake in the built environment, right? And so voila, what it is, it's speed core, right? That's my, uh, one of the, my most celebrated uh, uh, news that I get to share with engineers. It was developed, um, actually began on, in an application outside of commercial construction. So it wasn't even meant for commercial construction. It was meant for really sort of uh, uh, st strong use of steel in very kind of uh, uh, high security areas, right? And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give the name away of, of who it was developed for, but it migrated out of uh, another use into commercial construction. And SpeedCore was developed uh, precisely by MKA, uh, engineers out on the West Coast, the Pound Cow Foundation, and of course, AISC as well. It's kind of developed and, 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 and helped uh, spearhead uh, this concept of SpeedCore and, and Purdue University, right? Lots of research. Um, what it is, is if you can think about a sandwich, here we go talking about food once more. So if you think about a sandwich where you've got these uh, panels that are made out of steel, those are plate on the outside. And on the inside, you sort of just infill it with concrete. And you might ask yourself, well, what's in the middle? Well, in the middle, there is no rebar because we're actually eliminating rebar. And so what does that mean for when it's actually executed on site? It means that you're eliminating people that have to tie the rebar I don't know if you've ever been out to a project site, but some of that installation with concrete, I mean, that's pretty impressive and intense. The amount of rebar and tying the rebar and just kind of the bodies that are out there. And then you've got all the forming, right? You've got all of the wood that is, uh, you know, kind of used once. And so we want to, you know, not be as wasteful with materials that we use. And this is another great solution because you're also eliminating formwork that would be required for concrete. The speed core system uh, has sort of these teeth inside of the sandwich panels that uh, act as, uh, you know, sort of holding the, the, the panels together and the concrete together. And they, they act as stay in place forms. And the beauty of speed core is that you, you actually get to build the floors and the core at the same time, right? So why is this new news? It's because traditionally we talk about innovation in the built environment. And it's really hard to do, but it's great when you finally decide to do it, right? Innovate. And after we, we had the perfect team to say, hey, let's do this thing that no one has ever done before, right? It's kind of, it's kind of hard to get used to that, right? Like, here we go, taking risks. But that's what innovation is about. And so the response to traditional concrete core construction is speed core, right? If you think about a 60-story tower, you usually have to build what we're, what we're referring to as a leading core of concrete. You build it up so high, you wait some time, you let the concrete cure, and then you go back in and you start building your floors, right? And so that's the, uh, the way that we're, we're sort of uh, mainstreamed, uh, used to doing that. And so what's the alternative to that? If our question is on innovation, then we ask those questions. What is the alternative to concrete core, leading core construction? That answer is speed core. Now we get to build the floors and the core at the same time. So we're eliminating curing time 
and we're accelerating the construction schedule. We're eliminating bodies from being in the field. We're eliminating form work. We're even eliminating, in some cases, uh, permits that are required to close streets down to, because you need to have the concrete trucks, et cetera. So there is a lot that, uh, that is even beyond what you might consider immediately that really has an effect on improved performance, right? The very first project was out at Rainier Square on the West Coast that saved uh, over $10 million in construction costs. And it was, I want, I want to recall correctly, it was a 58-story tower. And how on earth, you know, does one accomplish that? Like that has never been done before, where you get to save money on a project with that scope, right? And you have you completed ahead of schedule as well. And so, you know, what is this uh, in the eyes of a developer? In the eyes of this developer, it was the, the most amazing news, right? This is like, I'm glad that I decided to be intrepid and, and be the first part of the team to do this. That's never been done before. And now they get to do more. Uh, we just had our second one down in San Jose at 200 Park that has also saved over $10 million in construction I just topped off, right? And this was for a 21-story tower. And it made perfect sense. I mean, when you're saving money, when you're mit mitigating risks, when you're innovating and giving it back to the industry, you know, this is what inspires, I think, all of us here in this room or in this virtual room um, to do what we do, right? Because these, these are the things that we're, we're actually living in a, in a revolutionary way of, of a being high scale construction, right? And it's only gonna spread and get better. Um, but the, the idea here is that all we have to do as an industry of stakeholders, of architects, engineers, contractors, and owners is to listen, right? And to be audacious enough to take it a step further and to implement it and execute it as part of your project. And these first two projects are the first two gleaming examples of that and that resulted in success. And the best news is that there's probably, I wanna say if I recall correctly, five more on the boards that are coming online. It's not just relegated to the West Coast for seismic. These are projects that can be implemented in any part of the country. So definitely uh, if the design community is not yet aware of Speedcore, um, ENR did a fantastic article, I wanna say last month, so we're in March, so you know, last month, my brain is kind of uh, somewhere else right now. Um, <laughs> that did a fantastic job on explaining what Speedcore is and why it makes sense and why you should really consider it as part of your project. So yes, think Speedcore. Yeah, thanks for that. That's really innovative because I have heard of it, but I haven't really delved deep into it. But it that sounds really interesting because I think traditionally at least here in the West Coast, it's usually if you're doing a tower like that, it's going to be a concrete core. But seeing that uh, new innovative uh, way to do, uh, maybe make that core out of steel and it can save time and money. That seems really interesting. I'm actually going to look that up now. That's It is. It's, yeah. quite, it's quite phenomenal. I mean, uh, you know, again, the fabricators, probably the, uh, you know, the one of the biggest players as part of this because these modules are fabricated off site, these panels, these sandwiches, right? And they're transported on trucks and it's really quite impressive. There, are, I'm sure there are YouTube videos out there that you could see how these are transported. But, you know, it's like the new Legos of doing things quickly and very efficiently and just stacking them on site, these giant modules. So quite phenomenal. I'd really encourage everyone to take some time to, to study it and really champion that. Yeah, yeah for that's that. great. <laughs> As I say, I think a lot of, it's been interesting. I feel like um, Matt and I have had some conversations with people about modular construction and moving things off site, especially in um, areas where construction, where maybe there's not like a laid on yard or something like that, where they can actually store those things on site. And logistically, uh, construction is getting very lean and it's interesting. You can see, uh, sometimes I think they do like a night overview of like a bridge or something, which was precast panel, right. not obviously not steel, but, uh, I remember watching one of those and it was like eight hours. They fully built a whole bridge that it's just like puzzle pieces. It was very cool. Um, so just to kind of pivot a little bit, cause you and I are, are, um, I'm a, lim a millennial. We kind of asked me a little bit earlier. I am a millennial. I think Matt, did you say you were a millennial as yeah. well? <laughs> <laughs> so the question about is, you know, 
The AEC industry is a very interesting one. Um, you know, you have like the older gentlemen who've been in it for 60 something years. And then you have, I, I'm seeing a lot more like younger, like these programs and colleges. I think you even mentioned you're from a and I think they have a really big program to getting uh, students into the construction industry. So what, in your experience, what are millennials saying about the future of the AEC industry? They want to get out ASAP. I'm, I'm kidding. No, no, that's, 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 that's. <laughs> like, well, this just got very sad. <laughs> okay, let's pivot. <laughs> no. This is a pivot. Okay, change the subject. <laughs> uh, no, so it's totally the opposite. There's just so much great energy, I think, uh, of these ideas, right? You know, and I really, earlier I said, I think we're in a revolution of, of new ways of doing things. Um, and I believe that I don't like the term, but I guess, you know, I don't know. I mean, it is what it is. If you've heard the, the term geriatric millennial, right? It's like they're saying that millennials are getting older, but I like to say that millennials are just coming of age. You know, they're uh, kind of going to take the reins on the future of the AEC industry. And the reason why I think it's so optimistic is because of what we're doing right now is because of this collaborative spirit of telling stories and sharing successes and inspiring others that look like you to say, hey, I could, I, could, I, could, uh, I could make it in this industry. Not only can I make it, I can contribute, right? I can speak my mind. And I think that's what we do is we, uh, we speak our minds. I think we, um, you know, I know for me, it took a while uh, to, to get out of this mindset of, uh, not saying anything or deferring because you thought that, well, I've, you know, I, I'm, not that, I'm not old enough to say this or, or you know, I don't have uh, X amount of gray hairs yet, so I'm going to wait until I do anything. But I, but I feel that as a collective, millennials are a little bit more audacious. They are really saying, I have a voice. Um, I have something to interject. I want to raise my hand for this, right? And so the future of the AEC industry in the, in the uh, eyes of millennials, I think it's, it's an industry that's very collaborative, that is open to dialogue and intersections. And so I see a lot of um, platforms that encourage uh, cross-pollination of engineers and architects and general contractors uh, in an executable fashion, right? So we're not just saying, oh boy, it'd be great to do this collaboratively. We're actually doing it. And in our offices, we feel that we work for a firm that is maybe a little bit more antiquated that, Kara, to your point, operating in a silo. I think millennials are raising the issue of, you know, I know some, an engineer that can do this really quite well, or I heard this because I went to this networking event and I heard about this system, and they're bringing that back into the office. So for all intents and purposes, I really feel that, you know, we're going to be a very dynamic industry. Um, whose owners are going to be proud of what we do because we, our ears are open. We're like sponges, and I think we're we're uh, we're bringing that value, that sort of energy and momentum to to the built environment. So totally stoked and excited about it. Yeah, and one thing you just said that I think is really important is we're willing to kind of take a chance on the innovative new things. Uh, I know a lot of. <laughs> I know a lot of millennials. I am a millennial. All of my friends are millennials. We're all <laughs> of the same age, but we're <laughs> more willing to utilize new technologies and new innovations. Uh, and I think that is very progressive. And, you know, they always talk about construction and I've always, I've had this conversation with friends who are like teachers or not in the industry. And they're like, you know, is it as like stagnant? as it right. seems or as is, you know, kind of projected into the world. And I'm like, no, like if you, if you really think outside the box and it's like the people that it, like the industry people who decide to not innovate, decide, decide to not, you know, invest in new technologies, they do stay stagnant. And then essentially they get pushed out of the market. hundred uh, percent those that decide to move forward and really adopt new innovations or even collaboration. Those are the ones where you see on those large projects and doing like really, really great stand-up work. So I'm glad you brought that up. 
Yeah, absolutely. Even Perfect. in the AEC industry, it's it's us millennials that are you know bring things up to our firms, and uh, I think a good amount of us are, you know, the, the ones that we speak up. That's if your firm's like the right firm, they'll listen to that because hey, why don't we do this? It saves us money. It makes us work faster. It'll help the client, and it's been tested and researched why not you know and like hey here's another firm that did it or here's another sample project where they've done it successfully things like that not just in construction but maybe even like the way we do our bim workflows and all that stuff you know that's that's us that's it's not like the old <laughs> the older engineers that are coming up with that and like implementing that new technology they usually what i found is uh you know someone like us like bringing it up to our companies and asking why don't we do this so it's really looking bright and there's a lot of opportunities for innovation uh alex i I feel like i want to wear a cape now and just start flying like i feel so empowered (laughs) yes (laughs) (laughs) that's how we should see if we can add that in on the video (laughs) yeah well that'll be our thumbnail (laughs) (laughs) alex uh i wanted to switch gears well yeah, I kind of switch gears. I know you're a big proponent of mentorship. Uh, how important do you think it is to establish a culture of mentorship? And what was your experience with it? Well, you know, that sort of ties into what we just finished talking about, about being able to speak up. And, you know, I think a lot of times we might almost try to make mentorship a little too cumbersome when it can be really quite simple. And I've definitely been a benefactor of leaning on others and sort of uh, uh, defining my deficits by learning from people who know, you know, are probably more experienced or have more knowledge in, you know, uh, one niche versus another. Uh, But I think, Matt, something that kind of ties into what you just said, kind of bringing ideas back to your office and also identifying you know, even, even more tenured seasoned professionals as champions of mentorship is really important um, to, to lean on them. And so I would say that um, this to me, uh, you know, on this platform, on this pet podcast and on similar other podcasts and on people who take the time to develop content like this, this is like mentorship. I think, you know, I met, I just met you, Kara, I've met you before, but I feel that, you know, we're, we're, kind of in this boat together and we're learning from each other and you know this is probably not the end of our running into each other right as an industry I think we're probably going to see each other's faces again and so I think that's the idea behind mentorship is that you have these magical moments of interacting with people and being able to leave behind an indelible impact right and that's in terms of lifting them of saying hey you know Uh, This is not a stuffy environment. I definitely can identify with some of your concerns. I had to get over those hurdles. And mentorship goes two ways. There's no age to being a mentor, right? You don't, you know, uh, you can be 90 years old and be a mentor, or you could, you could be 90 years old and have a 20 year old as your mentor, because there's different um, paradigms that you bring onto each other. In an environment where you're sort of feeling lost, and I, you know, I've, I've, I've definitely had these moments where you kind of feel that folks aren't listening, that maybe your ideas aren't being heard, then you identify someone who is willing to listen, and you form kind of this uh, existential relationship where there's, there's communication that emboldens you as a professional, right? It doesn't have to be that you're meeting every other week or every week. It doesn't have to be anything strict or very five. You can just be someone that you lean on and find inspiration. I actually could take that, that one step further in this world of social media where we can connect you know, via LinkedIn or other platforms and find people that have done amazing work and you just admire what they do. You could send them a message and start interaction that way, right? I think that the world that we li- live in is really conducive to that, right? And so you can have, in a sense, what are known as virtual mentors, where literally you've never met anyone, but you know that if you send them a message and you get a response back, that's a really good feeling, right? To say, oh, wow, I had no clue because I thought that, you know, you, you're, a, you're a New York Times bestselling author and I sent you this message and I got a response back. How awesome is that, right? 
but I think, I think that, you know, that, that is a definition of mentorship is to, is to um, lean on others, to lift yourself up, but also when you build that confidence to look back and lift others up, right? That's all you have to do. So um, yeah, that, it is what it is for me. His mentorship is, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could just be being responsible and being human and being, being sensitive and, 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 uh, and learning how to say thank you and then, you know, passing it back. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Because I, I, I don't know anybody that hasn't gotten to where they are, at least in the AEC industry, you know, doing it alone. Like uh, if you're out of school, you're not going to start your own construction firm or engineering firm right away. Like, I don't think there's a way to do that safely or responsibly. I mean, it's kind of like you, it's kind of like the apprentice and, and the mentor. I've learned all of my stuff from uh, everyone that's helped me and, you know, passing it on to the next generation with uh, whatever I can to, to help. And I think that's how the industry gets better for sure. Yeah, 100%. I completely agree. And I will just say that I am shamelessly stealing, defining your deficit. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Essentially is like minding your gaps. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah, exactly. It just, yeah, it's good. It's, it's a better way of saying I suck at this, right? So <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. I'm going to try and use that in my next conversation at any point in time. <laughs> so, so Alex, to end off here, um, you know, we have a wide breadth of listeners from young engineers in maybe still in college, maybe even defining themselves prior to college, um, all the way up to practicing professionals. Do you have any final advice for engineers considering a career similar to yours? So I'm going to use the very wise words of one of my mentors, who is a virtual mentor, but now we've actually seen each other's faces via the, the tube through the pandemic, Evelyn Lee, um, who's an architect. Uh, but here's the phrase that I kind of appropriated. Thank you, Evelyn, if you're listening. And so, so that phrase is, don't think of your career as a destination. Think of your career as a journey, right? Because... I think if we if we if we're able to think about it that way, it uh, kind of re reduces and relieves us of the stress from meeting expectations that we put onto ourselves. And all we can do as professionals in the built environment is to you know build ourselves up as much as we can, with the anticipation that what we're doing now at this moment is giving it 110 percent. And then years from now, we we aspire to grow professionally. But even if we don't know where we're going to end up, we know that we're preparing ourselves to get there. So that's the advice that I would give your listeners is to think of your career as a journey and not a destination. Oh, that's great advice. <laughs> it also makes you kind of enjoy even like all of the learning experiences that come with the different uh, choices that you make in your career. Yes. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Alex. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate hearing from you. And next time I'm in Houston, I'll have to see if we can get lunch or something. <laughs> Woohoo! Party in Houston. Thank you, so much. <laughs> I know. thank you both so much. This was wonderful. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much, Alex. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We would love to hear your feedback, comments, and there are any questions you may have. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 74, as well as any links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during the episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, we wish you the best in all your structural engineering endeavors.